Welcome back to the Undefeated Show Defining Moments Podcast. We're located in Kyle Golding's beautiful studio inside of the Better Business Bureau, downtown Oklahoma City. And today's very special guest is Brigadier General Wyatt, the director of the Joint Staff for the Oklahoma National Guard. Sir, thank you for your service and welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Defining Moments Podcast. This episode is brought to you by CMM Financial Services. At CMM, we know how hard it is to find someone who knows and cares enough to create the tax and wealth plan that you deserve. After walking alongside hundreds of clients for the past 20 years with accounting, bookkeeping, tax strategy, and financial planning, we have created a proven system to help you reach your financial goals. CMM has your complete financial team to reach your financial goals. Book a call at cmmfinancialservices.com. Before we get started, we've got a few gifts for you. Here's a can opener. Oh. First one ever made. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then, we don't know how you take your coffee, uh, yeah. but hopefully you'll take it in a mug. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, so I started drinking coffee at the age of 14. Okay. Because I heard it might stunt my growth, and <laughs> it didn't. No, know? it didn't. I'm 6'4", and, uh, yeah. and, uh, but uh, I used to put cream and sugar in my coffee until I joined the Army. So now, how do you take it? Just black. My first cup of coffee in the Army, I put the creamer in it, and mm -hmm. it coagulated and floated to the top and I thought I don't think I can do this army stuff and so uh, I had a squad leader tell me hey if you if, if you drink it black it's hard to get that wrong so uh, the, ever since I joined the army I had to switch that's so true I uh, I take my coffee straight up black uh, for the most part I do drink a coffee that I call or someone's called someone called a bulletproof coffee so it's butter grass-fed grass-fed unsalted butter some MCT oil, they call it Brain Octane, and some Stevia Sweden, and I'll blend it up. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever tried I that. I have. I have tried that. You yeah, like that? I do. Yeah. Do you? Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. I got one more gift for you. Okay. This is from a good friend of mine. He's a retired 25-year senior chief in the Navy. Okay. And he has a CEO. He's a CEO of his own company called QB Impact. Oh, wow. Quarterbacks and uh, linebackers and linemen and just an awesome man and Wanted to gift that to you, sir. QB Impact Football Academy. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Located here in Oklahoma City. Excellent. I'll have to pay them a visit. I'm a former player myself. Okay. Um, came from a, a, a line of football players. My grandfather, my my father. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather played at uh, Oklahoma State University and was on the 1945 team where they won the national championship. Oh, wow. He later on became a Hall of Fame football coach. And then my uh, father... Uh, who played at Stillwater High School and won a state championship there, mm -hmm. ended up playing quarterback for Southern Methodist University. And so that kind of prompted me uh, during my sports days uh, to stick with football. Yeah. I probably wasn't the, 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 you know, the perfect poster child to, to play football. I was too tall and too skinny, but I was fast <laughs> enough. To, to play, and I ended up playing at Northwestern Oklahoma State University as a, okay. wide, as a wide receiver. So. Wow, very good, very yeah. good. Yeah, I'd love to have you meet him sometime. And he's got a new gym coming open, I think, believe, this summer sometime. Uh -huh. And so he trains every Sunday here locally. And, yeah, I'd love to have you visit him. It'd be great for you guys to meet. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about you, Brigadier General. We, we love hearing about stories. This year's theme is ad our leadership through adversity. Mm -hmm. Let's take, would you mind taking us back to August um, in the mid nineties, your assignments and take us through those assignments and how, and what did it teach you and how did it feel like to get from where you were to where you are currently? And then what would you see yourself futuristically in the next five years? Okay. Uh, you know, you know, when I first became an officer, uh, I quickly developed a goal and uh, I thought it was a very achievable goal and and I, I really think uh, in order to to keep going forward and to keep striving uh, for for uh, for betterment is to develop goals and so uh, being being a young officer uh, at the time I developed a goal that I wanted to be the best company commander that I could be but it wasn't for myself 
uh, I wanted to be the best company commander for the soldiers that I represent. Mm-hmm. And so I, I worked towards that goal. Um, and not only have I got to do that goal once, but I did it twice. And both times we're in, uh, in the country of Iraq. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, you know, always having that goal in mind and, and taking the steps to, to meet that goal. Um, I always concentrated on, on what I needed to do to not just better myself, but how do I portray that down to the soldiers that mm-hmm. I represent? Mm-hmm. When you, when you talk about that, it, it's leadership. So your first assignment was in the mid-90s, and then what were the steps to from that first assignment to your second one? It's almost like going from second lieutenant to first lieutenant. Right. Yeah. So as a second lieutenant, I, I was very fortunate. I started off at Delta Company 179 up in Ponca City, and uh, we had, back then, we didn't have an officer shortage. We actually had uh, two officers over when I first went there, and they put me in charge of 4th Platoon. And I was only there for maybe a month, maybe two months, mm-hmm. when uh, an opportunity came, and they were the National Guard was converting the 189 Field Artillery, which would have been, um, I believe, Blackwell, Alva, Woodward, uh, those those uh, old armories that were up in that area, converting them from the field artillery to an infantry unit. Mm-hmm. And that was to be Bravo Company 179 Infantry. And I had come from Bravo Company as an enlisted soldier. Uh, at that time, it was down in uh, Perry, Stillwater, and Cushing. And so we were doing all this, this major uh, kind of realignment, shuffling around, and uh, they, they said, well, you live in Alva. So this would be a perfect opportunity for you to be at one of the platoons that's out there. And, and your former infantry as an as a enlisted soldier. So you would be better be able, you'd be in a better position to help train the field artillery into infantry tactics. And so I took that position and I was there for, I want to say, two and a half, uh, closer to three years and had some great NCOs that I worked with at that time. And I was kind of by myself, kind of off on my own. Uh, the company command was in Alva, and I was in Cherokee at the time. And so uh, I would have to give my guidance, usually over the phone from the company commander, and then uh, uh, push that guidance down and at the same time uh, start training the, the, the field artillery into, uh, into that infantry company. Mm-hmm. Uh, had a platoon sergeant that came in, uh, Jeff Mapes, who was phenomenal uh, throughout my career. And he not only was my platoon sergeant, but later on he was my first sergeant when I was the company commander. And then on the second deployment, he was the command sergeant major of the battalion when I was the headquarters company commander. So I saw him on a daily basis. And he later became the uh, the brigade sergeant major when I worked on the staff at the brigade. And so as a mentor and as a as a, an extremely intelligent person, but as a mentor, he really helped me uh, in my progression. Uh, I would say at an early age, I was more aggressive. I don't want to say I was short-tempered or anything, <laughs> but I was more aggressive, and there were times that he he allowed me to, he kind of held me back and, and said, hey, let's, let's think about this before we take the next step, mm-hmm. uh, especially over in Iraq when Things are uh, heated anyway. Uh, there were times that that because of the whatever unit that we were attached to, maybe we didn't see eye to eye, or maybe uh, they did things differently. Uh, it would cause me because I'm, you know, for the most part, one trying to accomplish a mission, but two trying to protect my soldiers the best that I can. And other units interfering would cause me to get uh, pretty hot tempered. But having Jeff Mapes there was a huge factor in, in pretty much keeping me out of trouble. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but uh, so I went from second lieutenant to first lieutenant. Uh, as a first lieutenant, I was a support platoon leader for the 179 Infantry. Went to a JRTC rotation down at Fort Polk, Louisiana, as such. And I think that really helped me on the logistical side and learning what it takes to support combat operations 
and that gave me success further down the road as a company commander because I wasn't just worried about the tactics and how we were going to, you know, do something, but how are we going to support that as well? Uh, soldiers need food, vehicles need fuel. Um, there's, you know, not just bullets. Mm-hmm. So how, how do we do this and how do we sustain ourselves uh, to move on to the next mission? Mm-hmm. What led you to serve in the military in our country? I think I've always wanted to serve. Uh, I think about my first memory as a, as a child and my father served. He was a, a, an Air Force pilot. And he was flying the F-106s up in Minot uh, Air Force Base up in North Dakota. And I can remember having a little snow suit on and standing out in the snow and being next to the squadron house and smelling the fuel. You know, off, and they were on alert for some reason. I don't, mm. I don't remember why. But, you know, they, they keep the planes running and the fuel uh, and kind of smelling that and, and feeling the, the hearing the sounds and feeling the sensation and thinking that's what I want to do. Yeah. You know, as a two year old or a three year old, however old I was. (laughs) And I think about that. And, uh, for my youth, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's really what, instead of reading books and studying for school, I was reading, uh, I, I could have told you the, the speed and the armament of every aircraft from from the Vietnam era wow. all the way up to the ones that we had, you know, just prior to the Gulf War. And uh, maybe I should have put my studies more into school so I could be a fighter pilot <laughs> than to dream of being one. But uh, uh, but that I always had a sense that I was going to serve in some form or capacity, and mm-hmm. it just wasn't until later on uh, that I realized – um, where I was and what I was doing and, and how I could serve. But uh, there's a there's a, a picture I've seen recently, and it's a, a baby crying. And then there's a caption right above it, and it says, I wanted Air Force, but my grades say Army. You know, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's kind of what happened to me, you know. And at the time, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, especially pri- or especially after the Gulf War, in order to be an Air Force pilot or a fighter pilot was you go to the Air Force Academy and graduate top in your class. Well, I knew that wasn't going to happen with me. So I went to a, a, the National Guard, had a pizza feed for the football team after our season was over. And I went out and I climbed on an ambulance and I messed around with a, 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 a Humvee, a, a tow vehicle uh, from Delta, from the Delta Company. And I heard this noise in the back, and uh, that it was an M60 machine gun. And so I went back there, and they let me fire off about 10 rounds. And I said, where do I sign? Wow. And uh, I made my first goal when I signed with the National Guard. And that goal was to get 20 years. Uh, because if I, I knew if I got 20 years, I would be able to support myself after I retire, and I wouldn't have to worry about money. Mm-hmm. I would have a sa- I would have some form of salary, and if I live beyond that salary, that's my fault, right? <laughs> uh, but but I would have some form of salary, and so uh, you know, I ask people out there today how many seventeen year olds are thinking like that? Like, yeah, I want to have a career where I get a retirement, and you know, at the age of thirty seven, mm-hmm. uh, that that I've qualified for a, for a retirement from the military. And so that was my first my first goal, and that that's my first time that I I invested and said, okay, I'm going to serve, and I'm going to serve in this capacity. Mm-hmm. Do you think in today's society there are a lot of 17 year olds that thought like you? No, no, <laughs> not at all, <laughs> not at all. Uh, you know, as far as the patriotism, I've always loved my country, and I've always uh, I've always had that that feeling. And I've always wanted to serve, and I, I don't know where that where we are with youth today, if if they do love their country, if they do uh, want to serve, you know, just looking at the raw numbers out of a hundred kids that are graduating high school today, uh, and it it bounces back and forth, but I'd say between eighteen and twenty three students only qualify to be in the military. Wow. And out of those 18 to 23 students that actually qualify, that are allowed to be in the military, how many of them want to be in the military? Mm-hmm. And now we're looking at one to two. 
out of a hundred. Oh, those are incredible numbers. I did not know it was that low. I knew it was pretty low, but I didn't realize it was that low. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, well, here's your chance. You got 16, 14 to 17 year old young men and women. What's your advice to them? The, I would say you need to look at your future. You, you need to concentrate on your future and not, you know, yes, we, we're living in the present. We need to live in the present, but you have to keep your eye on the future and where do you want to go and start making those goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and they need to be achievable goals. You know, one of my goals of playing in the NFL, when I, when I realized real quick that, that I wasn't going to make the NFL, uh, I better do something else. Well, that's when I decided to go to officer candidate school mm -hmm. and become an officer in the, in the uh, army. Mm -hmm. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's good advice, just good overall round advice of make those goals and make them achievable. I like that. If you could sit down for coffee with three people, who would they be? Interesting. I really haven't thought about that. Um, we're talking present or we're, we're Any, just anybody? Anybody. Um, I would really be interested to talk to some of our former presidents, uh, especially George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Mm. I, I think those were key times in our country, key times in the world uh, that I would really get, like to and I know there's books out there that I could read that that would brush me up on that, but just to sit and talk with them, uh, I, I think would be um, would be outstanding. Uh, so one more, I would want to um, that's interesting. I, I, I have to think about the third one, okay because I, I, I don't want to uh, I, I want it to be somebody. Uh, looking into the future, uh, and so I, I would want to uh, talk to somebody in uh, of present time, and uh, uh, so I'm going to have to think on that one. Okay, we'll uh, follow back up <laughs> with that in a few minutes. What's something you want to do in the next five years that you're going to regret not doing if you don't start? next five years that I don't regret if I don't start. Uh, I, I want to start looking at transitioning from the extremely busy life that that I'm having. And it may not be five years. It may be more like eight years mm -hmm. or, or maybe 10 years. Sure. But I want to look at a, a smooth transition from the, the life that I'm at now into a more relaxed, more... Uh, uh, laid back and time giving instead of trying to scrounge for time yeah it, it would be it would be giving back some time mm -hmm. uh, to either your local community or family or a vacation here and there <laughs> uh, I think that's what I would like to do uh, in the next five years and if I don't do that I'm gonna regret it <laughs> <laughs> where would you like to go on vacation sir I've been, you know, I've been everywhere. Uh, I haven't been to Alaska. Okay. Uh, I have an aunt and uncle that live up there and a cousin that live up there. Mm -hmm. And I keep wanting, I, I had a senior trip and from high school that my grandfather was going to take me up there and I ended up joining the army. So, okay. so I missed out on the Alaska trip, but I'd like to go there. Um, I, uh, I would like to go through I've been to Ireland and Scotland but not in the capacity of a vacation mm. so I would like to do that as well okay but I've been all over Europe and um, uh, and I would certainly go back yeah um, I don't know maybe Argentina okay but put put, uh, put my Spanish to use that I minored in and I never used so uh, that that may be a trip okay are you a big soccer fan? I am getting to be okay. uh, more of a soccer fan. Okay, uh, I didn't grow up that way. I did play soccer one year, you know, in, in my youth, but it was I was more of a football, uh, baseball fan growing up, and now I'm starting to get in uh, to a little bit of golf and a little bit of uh, of uh, 
I guess, world football. Yeah. Or soccer. Yeah. And and so it's it's especially this last year. It was interesting to watch mm-hmm. the 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 dynamics of that as it yeah. as the World Cup played out. And so yeah, I think that'll be a good pastime. Yeah. 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 To get involved with. What's your favorite NFL team and college football team? I probably know the answer to college football, but you go ahead. Well, the NFL team has always been the Dallas Cowboys ever since I was a kid. And I know I, I have a hard time with that because Jerry Jones really upsets me every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I have to get through my, my anger <laughs> issues when it comes to that. Um, and uh, But they've always been they've always been my favorite. And then... Uh, I don't know. I, I do like the Chiefs just simply because of their their location. <laughs> sure. I, I'm not jumping on the bandwagon because they won this year, but uh, I love watching Patrick Mahomes play. I think he's a very dynamic player. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I, I'm I'm trying to support my local teams as much as I can. So I do cheer for Houston every now and then. Okay. Um, maybe Denver every now and then. It just depends. I I like Arizona. Uh, but. Uh, I always got to cheer for Dallas. <laughs> well, they they had that phrase: "America wins when the Cowboys lose." <laughs> and my wife was sleeping through a game, a Cowboys. I think they're playing Philly, but she woke up. She's like, "How do they? How that Cowboys do?" I was like, "America won." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that in the past. Oh, I always like the. Uh, I always like the Dallas Pittsburgh games. Oh, and yeah. I always like the Dallas Philadelphia games. Yeah, yeah. I think those are some good rivalry teams that, that I like to watch. Yeah, I, I kind of do miss those rivalries, especially back when the Giants were really good too, and the Cowboys played. And I gotta be careful. The co- Commanders, mm-hmm. right? Commanders, or is it Washington Commanders? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Back in the day when you know, mm-hmm. they played the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Oh yeah, fun to watch. College team, I'd say, uh, you know, just like the Dallas Cowboys, the Oklahoma State, uh, they upset me just as much as Dallas does, but I always have to root for them, you know. Being a Stillwater boy, and and uh, I didn't go to Oklahoma State uh, simply because of that. I, I wanted to play football, and, I, and at the time, Oklahoma State did not have a law enforcement program, and that's mm-hmm. kind of what I was looking at going into, and Northwestern did, uh, and so I went up to Northwestern. Uh, to to play up there but uh you know my my grandfather played there i have had uncles play there my sister played basketball there okay um and uh so i always have to root for the cowboys now i will say that if unless the cowboys are playing the sooners that I'm an OU fan too, and I'll root for the Sooners. Wow! Uh, except Bedlam, Bedlam, I gotta, I gotta throw on the orange shirt. So, <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, I'm the opposite, big time <laughs> OU fan, and it doesn't matter who Oklahoma State plays. Wong is not rooting for Oklahoma State. Oh, it's oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm a big Coach Gundy fan, though. Okay, I, I'm a huge Mike Gundy fan. So, if you have any connections, let's get him on the show. Yeah, we can talk about it. <laughs> If you think back upon your life, what are maybe a couple mentors that you had that you really enjoyed and what did you get out of them? So uh, I've had so many. Um, it's really hard to nail it down to just a couple. I would say that I've learned a lot from so many people, but I also it's also learning the negatives too, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. So, uh, so when I, it's like we have our own toolboxes and, and I'll see a leader do something and I'll say, Hey, that's, that's a pretty positive move right there. I'm going to put that in my toolbox and I might use that later on. But then I've seen a leader do something and I, I think, okay, I, I see where they're going, but I'm not going to put that in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. That's just not who I am. Right. Uh, And so, um, I, I really I mean I've enjoyed all of the commanders that I've worked for. I, I don't I don't think I've had a bad commander uh, that I despised or a bad commander that that was really that gave me bad advice or anything like that. All the way down to when I was a, a platoon leader, the the commanders 
um, that I had then uh, were very understanding and uh, did some very good mentorship um, that helped me to kind of develop into who I am today. Mm -hmm. And we all make mistakes, right? So the mistakes they made, I paid attention to mm-hmm. so that maybe I wouldn't make those mistakes. Yeah. But then I've made my own mistakes as well. Yeah. So I'm hoping that I have the same reflection or the same uh, gift to pass down to my subordinate leaders when they say, yeah, I remember when Colonel Wyatt said this, I'm not going to say that, you know, or some, <laughs> something to that effect. Sure, but, sure. Yeah. If you were to go back in time and think, from let's say 30 years ago to current day what are some defining moments that you've gone through that led you to your current trajectory where you are in life the there's positive ones and there's negative ones Mm -hmm. uh and i think how we i think how we view those and how we react to those will determine our success Mm -hmm. i had a uh, I always think about this because in most cases this was a, this would have devastated somebody and they wouldn't have gone any further. Uh, but I had a teacher in high school, uh, and I'm, I know she meant well, but I was staying after I was struggling and I was staying after class to get some some tutoring and she was trying to show me a problem and she finally just put her pencil down and said, you need you don't need to go to college you need to go to a trade school and you need to learn a trade because you're not going to make it in college and in i think in most cases somebody who desired to go to college that would be pretty devastating to them Mm -hmm. but for me it just ticked me off i said oh yeah well i'm going to show you you know so, so that was kind of my attitude back then right and but i think that was a defining moment because that was a moment that that really said uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to overcome this and I'm going to go after what I think I need to do. I've had that happen in track. I've had it happen in football where I had a coach maybe say something or do something that had, that should have been a negative uh, effect. And instead it just, it just gave me more drive mm-hmm. uh, to improve. Mm-hmm. Um, but then on the same token, I'm not going to do that to other people there's going to be a, a different way that I approach somebody sure. that's having an issue uh, to try to be positive. And I think I learned that from, from my grandfather, who was a, a, as I said, he was a football coach. His goal, his daily goal was to help at least one person a day. Mm. Um, and I think he was very successful at doing that, but he was always very positive about it too. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had players that played for him that probably should not have played in college, but because of his efforts of making film for his players and, and kind of showing the, their highlights mm-hmm. and then encouraging them that, hey, if you really want to do this, here's a workout plan for you. Uh, here's a nutrition plan for you. Doing things that, that normal coaches uh, typically don't do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I think I, I, I gained a, a lot from, from him as well yeah. um, in some of those moments. Defining moments in the military, um, I, re- I really think it depends on wh- where you are, what you're doing, and who you're in contact with that, um, that really resonate with you. And it could be anywhere. It could be at a school, at a graduation, or it could be... The fact that you, you like, there was one defining moment that I can think of, and that is in the early stages of Iraqi freedom, we weren't allowed to fly American flags because the, uh, it, uh, for some people, I guess it represents an occupation force, and we didn't want to be mm. considered an occupation force. And so no American flags, we had to take all those down, but they didn't say anything about an Oklahoma flag. And so pulling onto a base, we could always find our soldiers because there was always an Oklahoma flag flying. Wow. Wow. And so that's kind of, that's a defining moment, I think. That's awesome. Um, And uh, just the pride of being from from Oklahoma. And 
there's there's some bad times that have been defining moments. Yeah. Uh, there's been some times that, you know, whether it's uh, uh, PTSD or or not taking care of myself, where my body went into a, a, a bout of uh, insomnia, and I had to be medically evac. I think that's a defining moment. Uh, it's not a positive one, mm. um, but it also gave me the drive that I need to get through this and I need to get back to my soldiers uh, so that I can complete that mission. And uh, that was definitely a defining moment in, in my, in my life, not mm-hmm. just my military career. Insomnia as in you couldn't sleep for days. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, wow. It's not fun. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it and that you know that just goes back to lessons learned, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, in my youth, back when I was talking about you know being with uh, Command Sergeant Major Mapes and and uh, going through training events where I'd stay up for three days at a time, and I could do that when I was twenty three or twenty five, mm-hmm. and I could go to Ranger School when I was twenty eight or twenty nine, but when I hit the age of thirty eight my mind and my body are telling me, hey, you can still do all these things. You've already tested yourself. You know what your limits are. But one thing that I didn't take into account is my age. Mm. And that's something that nobody controls. You don't control your age on how much older you get. (laughs) And I did not uh, take that into consideration. Mm. And due to the previous deployments and due to the op tempo and due to all these other things that, uh, that were going on, um, you know, I had some, some, you know, what I would call minor PTSD from some of the other deployments that were mixing in with the, with the, uh, not sleeping Mm -hmm. and, or staying up for days. And what that does is it, it really chemically changes your brain and how your brain's functioning. And mm-hmm. I had a brain that wouldn't shut off and get sleep. And so it led to, it led to insomnia. Yeah. And then I started having, you know, what, what, what really caused me to seek help uh, in trying to get it fixed is that I was having uh, daydreams that were interfering with current operations uh, and me being in the position that I was in, in charge of several soldiers, mm-hmm. uh, well over a thousand soldiers on that task force that, uh, I was going to, because of what it was going on, I was going to make a decision, uh, and put soldiers in harm's way. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I went to seek help and unfortunately everybody around me was like, uh, this is a, psychological thing. I'm a medical doctor. I'm a trauma doctor. This is psychological. We got to get you to Bagram. And then Bagram's like, yeah, you're not going to do any good here. We got to get you to Germany. And then Germany's like, well, we're full. And, and according to, you know, the doctors and nurses that you've been in contact with in the last few days, you're, you're done. You're going home. Wow. And so it was that process of getting home, getting the help that I needed and then getting back into the theater that, that uh, uh, I think changed a lot mm-hmm. for me, corrected a lot for me. Yeah, yeah. And now I know what my limits are, and I know what I can do to correct those issues. But most importantly, I can recognize it in other people, and I can, I can help them as well. Mm-hmm. When you see the American flag, what does it mean to you? I get, I get pretty teary-eyed at times. Um, I can think of, uh, being overseas and being tired and being dirty and hungry, uh, and wanting the mission to be to an end so that I can get some rest and looking up and seeing an American flag flying and it, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It, uh, it really tugs at the heartstrings and, uh, you know, to, to, to have that feeling. And, and I know other people don't have that feeling and I, I respect their, their wishes and I respect their, uh, 
their reason, maybe their reasoning for it, but I don't have those same reasonings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, to, to know what it's like to live in other countries and to know what it's like to, to have the freedoms that we have here, even though I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of those freedoms are taken for granted, but to not have those freedoms in other countries and, and to know what we have here and to see the, the representation of that being the flag really gives me, um, a lot of pride. Yeah. What are some things that when you were overseas, what did you see that was different from maybe a 16 year old kid where you're in a foreign country versus a 16 year old kid in the United States? Oh, that's drastic. Um, especially in Iraq and Afghanistan that we're talking about a totally different part of the world that has a totally different, function and mindset and uh, to, to, to see, to be out on a patrol in Afghanistan and to be laying in the prone on the side of a mountain and to have a kid walk up to you that's herding goats and mm-hmm. is barefoot. And I'm wondering how is this kid barefoot when I am wearing combat boots and about twisted my ankle seven times getting up to the top of this thing and I'm probably going to do the same going down and his hands were so dirty Mm -hmm. you know it's just I I had some dried fruit that I brought you know like a trail mix but it was like the tropical trail mix and it had the uh, the the uh, pineapple and uh, bananas and all sorts of dried fruit and he was sitting there, and first he stole my pins out of my uniform, which I let him have. And then he he just kind of sat there, and I said, are, I motioned with my mouth, I said, are you hungry? And he, he didn't say much, and I opened my bag up, and he saw it, and just the joy on his face, and he gasped for air. And he grabbed the bag, and I'm like, hold on. I said, hold out your hands, and I'm trying to get him to hold his hands out. But he's never been taught that mm. to where you hold your hands out in a cup and I can pour pour the fruit in your hand. And I opened the bag, which was a mistake because both his hands went into the bag and he grabbed everything and pulled it out and put it into a Gatorade. He was carrying a Gatorade bottle with a string tied to it mm. and the string was wrapped around him. And there was a little bit of water in that Gatorade bottle, and he dumped all the fruit, all the dried fruit, into the Gatorade bottle. And I looked at his hands, and his hands were just charcoal black. Mm. There was so much dirt and whatever else on his hands. And then he proceeded to feed me with his dirty hands. And I was like, oh, thank you. And I said, I'm probably going to get sick on this one, you know. (laughs) Uh, But... uh, but I think about that kid, and and I, w- I wonder b- about his future uh, in that situation. And then I look at um, I look at our society and, and our kids growing up. I'm not saying we don't have issues because we do, mm-hmm. uh, especially here in Oklahoma. Sure. And and but I will say in other countries that our kids here have um, a bigger and better opportunity. Yeah. Than they do in those other countries. Yeah. You you talk about how you see that, or you feel that maybe s- s- people in America and society, modern day society, do take their freedoms and things for granted. And uh, I definitely see that because we do live in the greatest country in the world, where we are, we have ample opportunities to be awesome. And I even see it in my professional uh, life and seeing man. You can be awesome today, but you're choosing not to be. It's a choice that mm-hmm. you're taking for granted. So I appreciate you saying that, sir. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. What are a couple questions you wish people would ask you, but no one ever asked you? I don't get a lot of questions about uh, joining the National Guard like I used to. And I really think if people knew what it would, what it's like to be in the National Guard and really knew the benefits that the National Guard provides that we would have a lot uh, a lot more 
kids these days or, or young people these days taking the opportunity mm-hmm. to at least look into it. Sure. Uh, I had this conversation just a couple of days ago with a, with a friend of mine, and I really think, you know, for so much, for so much of that is this, the stigma of boot camp that's been going on for years and you see it in the movies you know with like full metal jacket or Mm -hmm. uh uh, people being treated and disrespected and that doesn't really happen uh it it is uncomfortable or or it can be uncomfortable and you you're doing things that you you know you'd probably be rather be home on the couch than than in some bay having to having to mop a floor but Mm -hmm. But what it's teaching uh, is is it's teaching the discipline. It's teaching how to care for your equipment. It's teaching responsibility. It's teaching uh, time management. You know things like this that a lot of people don't normally get. Mm-hmm. And uh, the opportunities that the guard provides, as far as college or vocational schools, uh, and the cost of that. Uh, just recently, our our the uh, House and Senate passed a bill, and the governor signed it uh, to waive, um, or not to waive, but to include uh, the fees. So not only are you going tuition free, but now your fees are included in with that. Where we were seeing, like when I went to, when I went to school, fees were like one hundred and twenty dollars a semester, mm-hmm. and now sometimes in some cases the fees are more than the tuition. Yeah. Yeah. And and so to for in order for that to happen to give a chance for our our young soldiers to go to school, get an education, use the guards benefits uh in that aspect, I think is a lost jewel that a lot of people just either don't know about or they don't want to uh maybe they value their freedom a little bit more and they don't want to give up that freedom to go to boot camp. I I don't know mm. I don't know the <laughs> the answer to that, but right. but I, I wish I could get that message out, and that's the question that I wish you know people would ask me, ask me about. Yeah, that's awesome. So you just answered it, pretty much. Pretty much. I like that. <laughs> well done. Well done. Did you ever think about the third person you want to have coffee with? There's so many out there. I would say um, I would say somebody in the in the House or the Senate that's been and I'm talking the federal the federal House or Senate mm-hmm. because in the state we have term limits. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can only be in the House for so many years and the Senate for so many years. I would want to talk to somebody in the House or the Senate that's been there for an extremely long time and really have a good conversation of the change in politics between when they first got in mm. to where they are now how much it's changed them are they are they voting exactly the same as they did when they first got in are they um uh, in some cases have they flipped parties uh yeah i would and, and then i'd like to talk about their uh uh they're, I'd like to ask them questions on what they think about term limits. And, and, and I know the, the answer that I've always gotten is, well, we the people have control of that. If, if we don't like what we're doing, we vote them out. Mm-hmm. And that's the term limit. And by creating term limits, you're taking that power away from the people. But I think it's created some other issues as well, mm. and and I would be curious to get their opinions on it. Yeah, do you have an opinion on term limits? I do. The- I do. I would love to have been a platoon leader my whole career, <laughs> and then when I became a company commander, I would love to have been a company commander my whole career. And right. then when I became a battalion commander, and and I went went to went to Ukraine, I, I would love to have done that job my whole career. Mm-hmm. Um, but we in the military have t- what we call I don't want to we call it term limits but we we that's part of our duty is yeah. is to to train develop deploy and and then uh and then move on to our next position mm-hmm. otherwise i think we would get into i i don't think i would be a good platoon leader today 
because mm. I would be probably pretty burnt out on on a few things. Yeah. And um, and then there's a, some other things that I don't think I would have grown, you know, with. Yes, sir. Um, there, there's constant changes in the military, especially with technology. And would I be that platoon leader that was that was, uh, you know, using the tools I had back in the day? Would I have progressed into the technology that we have today, if not been forced into other positions? Uh, at, at different levels, mm-hmm. or would I still be the same old platoon leader as I was years and years and years ago? Right, right. And so, um, so that that's kind of my opinion on term limits as well. Yeah, is uh, we have I I think we have people that are that are in um, those levels that haven't changed with society. And now they are representing uh, generations below them that don't think and don't act the way they do. Right, right. And how can you represent, you know, a certain body that way? Sure. Yeah. No, that that would be the question that I would ask him, Mike. <laughs> Hopefully you, you know. get the opportunity, sir. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You talked about the American flag and what it means to you, you get teary-eyed. We were gifted a, a big rock with uh, our name, our last name on my wife and I at our new house, and they bought us an American flag in the pole because they just – we're all about America. Mm-hmm. And every time I drive up to the house, I, I get chills and just almost teary-eyed because it's just so powerful, so beautiful. And we do live in the greatest country, and it's just so amazing just to come home to that. Mm-hmm because of so many sacrifices others have given. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, what are you most proud of? My family by far. They didn't get their smarts from me. That's for sure. I think they got that from their mom and probably my dad and my mom and, and their grandparents. But yeah. no, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of my wife uh, who has stuck with me through all of this time. Uh, when we first started out, our first four years were together. It was just us. And I didn't go anywhere and do much uh, other than work a normal job and go to drill uh, once a month. And then when 9-11 happened, it really changed the dynamics of my job. And I was gone. I want to say I didn't really truly live at home for about eight years. And uh, that definitely started to, to – to have an effect and and play a role in our in our family and so at the time I was a what's called AGR active guard reserve which is our full-time national guardsman and I was in AGR position and a federal job came open up in uh, the area that my family was living in and I applied for it and I I got the job and I did that to to uh, move home and be back with them. It was kind of a crucial time. They were starting school, mm-hmm. uh, and it was kind of a crucial time for me to be there, only to get deployed again shortly <laughs> thereafter. But, but um, uh, she's done. She's done a, a lot to stick with me, and she has a, 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 a strong business in in our small community. Uh, she's a physician assistant and has has her own medical clinic. Nice, and. Uh, and then my kids, both valedictorian from high school, wow. daughter graduated with honors from Wichita State and is now teaching there. Son just started here at Oklahoma City University. Uh, state championships and all sorts of you know uh, things, speech and debate and one nice. act and all sorts of stuff. So I am super proud of them. Um, my own, I, I really think my only advice that I've ever given them is if you start something, you need to finish it. Don't, mm. don't quit halfway. There's people that depend on you, you know, especially if you're in a team. I love it. And uh, they've done that, and I'm super proud of them. And uh, I know they're going to go on and do great things. That's excellent. How would you like to be remembered? I've never really thought about that. Um I'm more of a, a, a present and leaning into the future of kind of guy. And so I guess if I were to say how would I like to be remembered, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who 
cared. Mm-hmm. Somebody who not just uh, cared for my country, but cared for my my, and not just for my soldiers, but for the local citizens as well. Yeah. That, that I that I'm around every day, um, and I try to do my best to to uh, give a positive attitude, a positive vibe. It's not always that way, especially in the family. They get to see the worst side of me, I guess. But uh, but I like to stay positive, and I like to um, – I, I really think positive action uh, has a, a whole much uh, better reaction than negative action does. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and I try to filter that down as much as I can. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, we appreciate your time and all your answers and the conversation so much. And thank you again for your service to our great country and our great state. And I uh, look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. All right, I look forward to it as well. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. you. For more Defining Moments podcast content, visit our webpage, www.undefeated.show. Follow us at Def Moments Pod on Twitter and at Defining Moments Podcast on Instagram.